Well, howdy, church. Everybody good? It was pointed out to me by my daughter this past week, Daddy, you start out every message the same. And because uh, she's got the New Spring app on her phone, I don't know if you've got that. She doesn't actually have a phone. She has one of those little iPod Touch things that we had. And she goes, Daddy, you start out every sermon the same. I'm like, thank you. You're grounded. So I, 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 but I really do love to know how you're doing. Even if I can't hear you, I can kind of feel the energy coming through the camera there in Columbia. And we got Greenwood and Spartanburg. And we got, like, campuses everywhere. Florence, 6, six o'clock services. So we're really excited. Hey, let me start out tonight. Um, just by kind of making an announcement, and if, you're, uh, if you don't attend New Spring Church on a regular basis, this is kind of like you getting com to come and sit at the family table. And it's not the weird thing like where you used to go to your friend's house and his mom would beat him in front of you and you had to go home and kind of figure that out. It, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, all right? Um, every year, uh, there's a magazine called Outreach Magazine. And Outreach Magazine comes out with the 100, a list of the 100 fastest growing churches in the United States and the 100 largest churches in the United States. Um, and uh, I, I was completely unaware of this list until 2006. And in 2006, uh, I got a, a note saying, congratulations, you're on the list. And I was like, yes! What list? Because I didn't know about a list. And they were like, and they kind of told me and I saw we were on the list and we were like, 78th largest church and the 94th fastest growing or something and and that was awesome and we celebrated that and every year we've kind of been on that list and it, you know it's kind of yay god or whatever well this year this year we got the list on um thursday the magazine came out on thursday with a list of the 100 largest and 100 fastest growing churches in the united states and i thought it was really cool going into the final weekend of step up that we got to celebrate this and listen, church, I just want to boast in what God is doing, what God is doing. You don't come from a living room with 15 people to what I'm about to tell you unless God is involved. This year, according to Outreach Magazine, New Spring Church, now, listen, there are 350,000 churches in America, and New Spring Church was named the fourth largest church in the United States. We can celebrate that. The thing I'm also excited about is we were listed as this, this past year as the second fastest growing church in the United States. And so I want to say, first of all, yay God, because God has done that. But thank you to the volunteers. Thank you to the, you, you show up. Thank you for inviting your friends. Thank you for all that. Everything you do is making a big difference. Now, because we've grown so fast in the past year, I mean, second fastest growing the church, and, and numerically, new, like they, they do that based on a percentage. Numerically, we added more people to our church than any church in America added to their church last year. So we're growing like crazy. But it's, it's brought some issues to our attention. We are having overcrowding problems at a lot of our campuses. We're having problems in the parking lot, and people are telling each other you're number one and kind of all kind of stuff like that. It's going, I know nobody here probably did that. And so we're trying to figure out what can we do, what can we do, what can we do, and we're working aggressively and step up, and that's what we're going to talk about this evening and making a, a commitment. We're building more campuses. We're freeing up more seats. But we were like, what can we do right now? Because if we started construction on every campus that we want to start today, it would be at least a year before we could get into those campuses. And so um, we've got some really smart people on our staff that sit around, and, and they figure this stuff out. And one guy came to us and showed us that if we will literally change our service times it will allow us to reach more people. So on every campus starting on October 20th, October 20th, we start a series called You Asked For It. You guys voted on it. 20, over 25,000 votes for that series. We're starting with a message, and listen, y'all asked for this. The opening message is what's the big deal about interracial dating and interracial marriage? Yeah, see, half the people are clapping. Half the people are clapping, and the other half are oh crapping. You know what I'm saying? I just made that up. That just came out. Thank you very much. I'll be here all night. Hey, y'all asked for it. Y'all asked. I'm not going to tell you what the rest are. We'll, we'll kind of release that information in the future, but that's going to be the first message. And so for that service, um, and, and for the services following, we're changing our service times. We're going we're gonna to literally, our service times, 
Um, at the Anderson campus, they're going to be 8.30, 10, 11.30, 5, and 6.30. And we're going to have to have five services. That's going to be true at our Columbia campus. At our other campuses, the, um, the service times, whether or not you have an 830 service is dependent. And listen, listen, the only thing that's going to change about the service, because I know this in particular is the 6 o'clock service, and you're like, my gosh, if we start at 630, what time are we going to get out of here? 10? Um, no. The only thing that's going to change about the service, we're not going to change anything about the music or the welcome. The only thing that's going to change are my messages are going to get shorter. And many of you have been praying for that for years. So, so we're going to shorten that message, and we're going to, um, and I promise you it's, it's, it's going to happen. And so there's more information coming out about our service times. But one more time on every campus, can we just thank God for what he's done in our church? Because that is a great thing. All right. Now. If, if you're here, and it doesn't matter if you're a church person or a non-church person. You could be here tonight because somebody, you know, bribed you or, or whatever, or they're trying to set you up with somebody. I, I, I'm just glad you're here. I, I don't care why. I'm just glad you're here. Um, but it doesn't matter if you have a church background or a non-church background. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. It doesn't matter your uh, race. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. There's one thing that all of us in this room this evening on every campus have in common. Everybody here, as you look back over your life, has made a bad decision. Everybody. Everybody here has made a bad decision. Everybody here probably has that season in their life or that event in their life. As you look back, you think, I wish I could go back and do it all over again. Am I tracking? Does everybody here have a bad decision? Does everybody here have a bad decision? Everybody on every campus, you got a bad decision. Don't point at your bad decision. I'm just saying you got a bad decision. Every one of us have made a bad decision. I was thinking about a bad decision I made when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I was six years old. I lived on the Mill Hill in Easley. I grew up on the Mill Hill in Easley, and my, my mom and my dad had a house. Um, we lived, literally lived on Hamilton Street. Hamilton Street, okay? We lived at number six Hamilton Street. My grandma lived at number five Hamilton Street. That's my mom's mom. And my mom would go over and check on her mom, and I would go over with my mom to check on her mom because I was a little kid. I was six years old. I didn't like being by myself because I freaked out all the time. Because, and, and this is another story for another time, and I'm in counseling, and I've got plenty of help, so don't worry about me. But my dad used to scare me all the time. He used to jump out of closets and behind doors and tell me stories about ghosts and goblins and all kind of stuff, and I was a freaked out kid. All the, I'm still a little freaked out right now. So um, my mom, I remember her coming to me one day and she said, Perry, I'm going to go over to your grandmother's house to check on her. And I said, I'm going with you. And she said, no, 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 you're going to finish what you're doing. I was like, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with you because there's stuff in the house. And she's like, your dad is got problems. All right. And so, and, and she said, I, and she told me, she said, I'm only going to be gone for a few minutes. And I believed her. And one of the reasons I believe my mom is because she's one of the godliest women I've ever known. She went on to be with the Lord in 1982. Some people say she lost a battle with cancer. I say she won the battle with cancer because she's with Jesus now. So she won, okay? My mom did not lose. And so she was, I mean, the first time I ever saw anybody have a quiet time, it was my mother. I mean, she was godly. She loved Jesus. She was a hard worker. She was a blue-collar worker. She worked second shift at a plant in Pickens called Singer, which is now called Ryobi. I mean, she was a get-it-done kind of lady, but she, and, and godly, but she had a touch of redneck in her. And y'all I'm talking about with a woman with a touch of redneck. Now, some of y'all are like, she's got more than a touch of redneck. Okay, I, I know, I know. Praise God. But she, and, and if you brought the redneck out, everything was going to go bad. So keep that in mind. So my mom told me, I'm going to go check on your grandmother. I'll be home in a few minutes. So I was like, okay, okay, okay. And she was gone longer than a few minutes. Way longer than a few minutes. I'm freaking out at number six, Hamilton Street. I am losing my mind. So I had this thought as a six-year-old, because six-year-olds have so much wisdom. When my mom comes back to this house, I am going to teach her a lesson. And I'm going to teach her a lesson by slapping her in the face. <laughs> Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, bad idea. <laughs> bad decision. Some of you moms need to look at your kid right now and go, bad decision. Bad decision. 
So my mom, true story, Hollywood couldn't have scripted this any better. My mom walked back into the house after being at my grandmother's house for 14 years, it seemed like. And she wanted to give me a kiss. So she came at me like this and said, hey, Perry, and stuck her face down right there. And I was like, obviously, God wants me to do this. <laughs> and I took my hand and brought it across my mother's face. I can still hear the slapping sound in my ear. I don't remember the next three days of my life, honestly, because <laughs> psychologists have said, because listen, I didn't have one of those mamas that believed in time out. And I didn't have one of those mamas that believed in you go in your room and think about what you did. I had a mama that believed in the belt. And she also believed in telling me when your daddy gets home. He, and daddy always came home. <laughs> right? I made a bad decision. Now there are people here tonight. You've made some bad decisions. We've made some bad decisions, but they're not bad decisions we can laugh about. It was a bad decision with a relationship. It was a bad decision with finances. It was a bad moral decision. It was a bad ethical decision. And because of the bad decisions, we feel trapped in our current state of life. And here's the main point tonight. If you don't get anything else I say tonight, I want you to walk away with this. A bad decision does not have to be the definition of your life. A bad decision does not have to be the definition of of your life. Your bad decision does not have to define. Listen, what you did does not have to define who you are. What you did or what was done to you does not have to define you. A bad decision does not have to be the definition of your life. Just because somewhere in your past you made a bad moral decision it doesn't mean you've got to keep on making bad moral decisions I know so many people that say you know what I, let me go ahead and say this and I didn't say this all day but I feel led to say this in the six o'clock service tonight I know people that go you know what I've already had sex might as well just keep on doing it a bad decision does not have to be the definition of your life just because you did something wrong doesn't mean you have to continue doing something wrong. And there's somebody here tonight that you needed to hear that. Just because you made a bad financial decision doesn't mean you need to spend the rest of your life broke. Just because you made a bad career decision doesn't mean that you need to spend the rest of your life doing something that you hate. A bad decision does not have to be the definition of your life. And tonight... I want to talk to you about somebody that made a bad decision. Now, if many of you are type A, you've already got your outline, if you've already got your Bible open to Matthew 14. <laughs> We're not talking about Matthew 14 tonight. In fact, none of those blanks are going to get filled in. You can't even fit what I'm going to say in those blanks. And let me tell you why. We had this message planned and prepared and everything, but last Friday morning when I was having my quiet time, God rocked my world with what I'm about to share with you. Never preached this before. I'm really excited about it. But somebody tonight needs to hear that you can step out of bad decision. Now, some of you are like thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, this is a building campaign, and this is step up. And I was taught, expecting to hear about a commitment. We're going to tie it all together. So just hold on, all right? This is an airplane sermon. It takes a little while to take off, but once we start cruising, we're going to cruise, all right? All right. Um, there's a guy, and if you have a Bible with you tonight, I want you to turn it to 2 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel 24. And please understand that God put a table of contents in the front of your Bible if you don't know where 2 Samuel is. Please don't try to, you know, I'm in Matthew. Okay, just use the table of contents, or you can thumb there on your mobile device, or if you're just like, forget it, I'll, I'll watch it on the screen. Hey, that's fine too. 2 Samuel chapter 24. We're going to talk about a guy that many of us know about. Listen. Even if you're an unchurched person or you don't know a lot about the Bible, you, I'll guarantee you, you've at least heard of this guy. His name's David. It's where we get the story from David and Goliath. I've literally talked to people um, that didn't know that David and Goliath was a Bible story. David and Goliath, that story is in the Bible. 1 Samuel 17, you can read the whole thing. Um, but David, if you know anything about the life of David, David had a history of making some bad decisions. Um, he made a bad decision one time 
where he looked out. The Bible says he's walking around the roof of his palace, and he looked around, and he saw a naked woman. Um, she was taking a bath. He was kind of watching her take the bath, and he said, I want her. And so he sent for her, and he took her. He took her. Her name was Bathsheba, and he took what he wanted. And he had sex with her, and he sent her home and said, that's, not, that's that. And then she went to Walmart and bought a pregnancy test and went, uh oh, and shot him a text that said, I'm pregnant. It's a little contextualization there. I'm modernizing it. Stay with me. I'm trying to make it relevant. And so he was like, oh, my gosh, she's pregnant. He said, I know what I'll do. Her husband, Uriah, was off fighting a war. He said, I'll just bring him home. And he's going to want to go see his wife, you know, see his wife, because I don't want him coming back home going, well, I was doing a little math. And um, and because you know what they say, mama's baby, daddy's maybe. Um, and so, some, some, you'll get that later. Um, that's not my baby. And so he was like, well, if I bring Uriah home, and then him and her kind of, and then and, 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 and it'll be like, oh, wow. Uriah, that baby looks nothing like you. In fact, it looks like me. Funny thing. Um, but Uriah, the Bible said, wouldn't go home and sleep with his wife. He said, how can I go home and sleep with her when the king's men are fighting in the field? And David was like, all right, well, I guess I'm just going to kill him. So David had him killed. B bad decision. C can we agree? I don't care where we are on the ethical scale tonight, Christian or non-Christian, I think we're going to have to agree that adultery and murder is a bad decision. Can we agree? Yes or no? Good. Good. Okay. So David made these decisions. He made bad decisions. Well, the, the decision that he made, the bad decision in 2 Samuel 24, I was emailing with a friend of mine in Israel this week, and we were kind of talking about this text, and he was telling me that he thinks that this was actually um, more sinful than the adultery and the murder because the adultery was thought about in the moment. He took what he wanted in the moment, and then he took Uriah's life. But in this passage, and I'm not going to read the whole um, chapter for you. I'm just going to summarize 2 Samuel 24. David, as the king of Israel, decided to take a census of all his fighting men. He decided to count the number of men in Israel that could fight in his army. Now, in America, um, or any country today, we would call that a smart move. We need to know how many troops we have. We need to know how many tanks we have, how many planes we have, how many ships we have, how many submarines we have. We need to know what our military might is, and, and all the countries in the world know that. But for David, this was a big deal. It was a sinful decision because when Israel became a nation, when the, when the Jewish people came out of Egypt and went into Israel, went into the promised land, God told them, I will take care of you, and I will provide for you, and I will protect you, and I will help you. And if you ever need anything, I will be there for you. God said, I want you to trust me. So when David chose to go and count the number of fighting men, he was essentially saying to God, I do not trust you. And any time we trust in what we have more than in what God has promised, it's going to be a bad decision. God has greater plans for our life than we have for our life. Many times we can only, we, listen, we get focused on what we can see and we don't understand that we serve someone outside of time, outside of space, outside of limitations. And he's so much bigger than what we can see going on in our world. But David said, I'm a king. I need to know this. And he basically was telling God, I don't trust you. Bad decision. Hey, every stupid, foolish, sinful decision that I've ever made in my life came back to the place where I told God, I don't trust you with my relationships. I don't trust you with my money. I don't trust you with my life. It always goes bad. Well, he had friends try to talk him out of it. Joab was like, I don't think you should do this. And if you've ever tried to talk a friend out of a bad decision, you know the pain in that when they, they're going to go ahead and push through it anyway. And he pushed through it. And after it was over, after he had counted everybody, the, the, the Bible says that a prophet named Gad came to him. Now, in those days... They didn't have like you version where they could pick up their iPhone and kind of scroll to a Bible verse. They didn't have copies of the Bible laying around. The way that God would communicate to people in that day was through a prophet. And so the prophet would come and say, hey, this is what God said to say to you. And so Gad came to David and said, hey, man, um, you made a bad decision. 
You made a bad decision. And because of that, there's consequences. And don't miss this, church. Don't miss this. There's always consequences for sin. Always. Many times people pray for forgiveness, and what we're actually praying for is freedom from the consequences that we know that are coming our way. Oh, that, w- that, that was good. There's always consequences to sin. It's always going to cost. And it's never going to be fun. I've known so many people that have told me, and I've been doing ministry now for over two decades, Perry, if God loves me, why is this happening to me? And the this that they're talking about so often is not God being mean to them. He's simply letting them reap what they sowed. And so... Gad tells David, you got three choices. Now, I love choices. I love A, B, and C, but I wouldn't love any of these choices because none of them were good. He said, you can have three years of famine. That ain't going to be good because I like to eat. You can have three months of running from your enemies. I I I don't like running from anybody. Or you can have three days of a plague that's going to kill thousands of people. David said something that was really profound. He said, well, God is merciful. Let me fall into the hands of God. I don't want to fall into the hands of men. And what he was basically saying is he wanted a plague to start. And a plague started, and literally in three days, from the northernmost part of Israel to the southernmost part of Israel, 70,000 people died. That's a big deal. This past week, we passed the anniversary of 9-11. And many of you, just like me, I can remember where I was on September 11th, 2001, when I heard the news about what had happened. And I cried. I cried when I saw the towers fall. Because when the towers fell, thousands of people lost their lives. And that's a day that as an American, I will never forget it. Most of us will never forget that day. Because thousands of people died. But in this plague, in three days, 70,000 people died. Can you imagine how crazy it would get in our country if something happened in our country where 70,000 people died in three days? Could we all agree that's a big deal? And then the Bible says that the angel that was executing the judgment got to Jerusalem and was about to destroy the city, and God told the angel, stop. God stopped the wrath on the city of Jerusalem. And when I was prepared for this message, before I even get into where we're going tonight, I started thinking, oh my gosh, that's what God did for me. That's what God did for you. That's what God did for us. No one here this evening has ever suffered the full wrath of God. God has always held his wrath off from us. In fact, the only person Ever that has received the full wrath of God was his son Jesus Christ on the cross when he took on all of our sin and everything we had ever done wrong and God poured his wrath out on Jesus so that in Jesus we would not have to suffer wrath for our sins but we could live in freedom from the sins because Jesus paid the price for our sins on the cross I'm glad tonight that I have a God that is a merciful God David made a bad decision. Let me ask you this question. Do you think, yes or no, out loud, every campus, do you think that David had some pain going on in his life because of this decision? Do you think that David had some confusion going on in his life because of this decision? Do you think David had some frustration going on in his life because of this decision? Yes, I'm quite positive David looked at this decision and said, if I had it all to do over again, I wouldn't have done it that way. The same thing, because there are people here tonight, you've got pain in your life because of bad decisions. You've got confusion in your life because of bad decisions. You've got frustration in your life because of bad decisions. And you've told yourself numerous occasions, if I had to go back and do it all over again, Again, but remember, what you did does not have to be who you are. 
I want you to watch what happens. I want you to pick it up with me in 2 Samuel chapter 24. We're going to start in verse 18. 2 Samuel 24 verse 18 says this. On that day, Gad, here's the prophet again. Remember, Gad's the prophet. On that day, Gad went to David and said to him, go up. I want you to underline those two words, go up. If you're brand new to New Spring, I encourage people to underline things in their Bible all the time. You go, oh my gosh, it's a holy book. I can't underline anything. Understand something. This right here is a tree held together by a cow. All right? You can, un- you'll get that later. Something like mama's baby, daddy's baby, tree, cow. Write that down. You'll get that later. All right, here we go. Go up. Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor, don't miss this, of Aranah, the Jebusite. So David went up, underline those two words, God said go up, the Bible says David went up, as the Lord had commanded through Gad. David made a bad decision. David's decision had pain involved. David's decision had cost thousands of lives. But when God came to David, God, did you, I want you to notice this in that text we just read. God never said, David, we're going to need to talk about what you did. And while we're at it, I want to bring back up Bathsheba and Uriah. We're going to need to talk about that too. David, you're a bad guy. David, you've done some horrible things. David, I am so ashamed of you. I want you to notice from this point on, God never brought up his past. 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 In fact, if you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, God will not bring up your past. Anytime your past is brought up, it's not God, it's Satan. And when Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future, and I'll guarantee you he'll start leaving you alone about your past. Isn't it great that God came to David and didn't even mention his past? He said, David, I want you to go up. Essentially, God told David, step up. Step up, David. God gave, told David, and then, don't miss this, in that verse we just read in the first verse, verse 18, God gave him a very specific next step. I want you to go and buy pretty much the threshing floor of Aranah the Jebusite. It wasn't vague. It wasn't, have peace, be nice, love people. It was, David, this is where you are, and I want you to step up to where you need to be. God gave him a very specific next step. And tonight, that's what God has for a lot of people in this room on every campus, and for those watching online or listening to the podcast, God's got a specific next step for you. And I love the fact that God doesn't bring up his past. See, God's not bringing up your past tonight. Listen, in Christ, you can step out of the prison of your past and into the potential of your future in Christ. Jesus Christ allows us to walk away from our past. Jesus Christ allows us to step up into who God's called us to be. But in order to accomplish more than we ever thought we could or imagine, we got to be willing to take that next step. Because the Bible said when God told David to step up, what's the next verse, or what's the next two words? David stepped up. God told David, and David didn't go, I'm not worthy. I've messed up my life. I did that thing, and I'm so ashamed, and it's awful. See, the devil wants you to feel horrible about what you did. Because if he can get you to feel horrible about what you did, you will never become who God's called you to be. Hey. Somebody here tonight needs to step out of your pity so you can step into your potential. And somebody here tonight needs to crawl out of your history if you want to achieve your destiny. God hasn't called anybody to feel sorry for themselves tonight. He's called you to step up. So what's your next step? What's your next step? Some people, God's called you to step up and ask for help because you've been struggling with an addiction. You've been struggling with an eating disorder. You've been struggling with suicidal thoughts. I'm getting personal right now. You're a lady here tonight. You've been struggling with infertility. And the devil's told you don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody because they'll think you're weird. You're the only one. Your next step tonight is to ask for help. Somebody here tonight, your next step is to receive Christ. People have received Christ in this, in, in, to, in all, all day in our services. 
Step up. What is your next step? Because here's what I know. If you're breathing, you've got a next step. God has something. Well, how do I know when God's done with me? You'll die. <laughs> I say that all the time. When God's done with you, he'll kill you. Until he kills you, you've got a next step. What's your next step? Hey, before I go on, let me just mention this. What's your next step financially? We're in a, come on, y'all, we're in a campaign. You know i got to talk about this. What's your next step financially? Some of you, it's just to try giving. You've never given. Hey, here's the next step for some of y'all. Just give. Just give a one, just go give. Go, go download the app. Go to newspring.cc and say, all right, I'm just going to try this giving thing one time. Hey, just give it a shot. See if it works. Some of you used to begin to tithe. Some of you used to give offerings. Some of you used to give extravagant offerings. What's your next step financially? Because here's what I know. You'll never get to where God wants you to go in life unless you're willing to take the steps that he leads you to take. And he's not led anybody in this room to take. He's led us all to become like Jesus and give. Amen? Amen. Well, it gets, it gets a little crazy. Because watch this. Verse 20. When, the, when Aranah looked and saw the king and his officials coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Aranah said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? You got to got to understand this is weird because kings didn't go hang out with people this would this, he's the ruler of the nation basically coming to Arana's house let's say tonight after the service you go home you get some nachos you sit on the couch you're watching a little Sunday night football somebody rings the doorbell you go and answer and the president of the United States is standing at your door you would be like hey man that thing I said about you that time I <laughs> any secret service men out there like if the president shows up at your house you're not going sup dog come on in get some nachos like you're like what is going on so that's what Arnas thinking why in the world has this guy shown up Arnas said why has the, my lord the king done his service why, why has my lord the king come to his servant David answered to buy your threshing floor I'm here because God told me to step up so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Now this next verse is one of the biggest temptations for a follower of Christ. Aaron, I said to David, let my Lord, the king, watch this, take. Don't miss that word. That's, that word's huge. Take. You might want to circle that word. Take. Let my Lord the King take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offerings, and here are threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Arana, gives all this to the king. Arana, all, he keeps talking about himself in the third person. That's weird. Perry's glad you're here tonight. Perry, glad you came in. Perry hopes you come back next week. Perry, like, what the world? What are you doing, bro? I just saw that. Your, your, your majesty, Arna gives all this to the king. Arna also said to him, may the Lord your God accept you. Now, at first, you're like, oh, my gosh, that is so cool. He just wanted to give him everything. But let me set it up this way. Every week, I get comments about my message. And let me just say this. I mean, it doesn't matter. Facebook, Twitter, some people actually write letters put stamps on them. Some of you are going to have to go Google that. You don't even know what that is. Emails and overwhelming. 99% of those comments that I get are incredibly positive. I'm probably one of the most encouraged pastors on the planet. I, I read these things. I mean, it's awesome. However, occasionally, I have the gift of ticking off certain groups of people in our church who do not like my illustrations like cat people <laughs> I, I don't like cats and I'm not gonna apply you would love my cat no I wouldn't no I wouldn't I don't I don't like as soon as your cat walks in the room I'm angry I'm angry I offend these people. I offend the, the ladies that have the stick figure families on the back of your minivan. <laughs> oh, that's cute. No, it's gross. Your family don't look like that. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. 
And what's the deal with the little dog? I mean, at the end, I'm like, that's the most jacked up dog I've ever seen. If my dog looked like that, I'd take it to the vet. <laughs> However, <laughs> the most commented on illustration this year by far has not been a Carolina fan, has not been a cat lover, has not been a stick figure family. It was the Sunday several months ago that I made fun of the men in the church that claim to be hunters but use deer cameras. <laughs> you would have think that I walked into a Catholic church and cussed the Pope. It <laughs> got insane. And listen, men, I want you to listen to him. If you're a hunter, I want you to lean in. I still don't think if you use deer camera, I still don't think you're a real hunter. I still don't think, well, you better watch it, you'll make them mad. What are you going to do, take a picture of me? <laughs> if you're a real hunter, walk into the woods, strip down naked, get a knife, sniff the animal, chase it down, kill it, and then drag it out. Then I'll respect you as a hunter. But don't tell me you're a hunter when you got a picture on your iPhone of the deer. I've literally had men in restaurants going, Pastor P, come here for a minute. Remember that thing you said about them deer cameras? Look at this thing right here. And I always ask the question, well, it, is that deer on your property? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Oh, why are you letting it live? Well, I'm just letting it get a little bigger. No, you can't shoot, bro. That's your problem. See, you can't shoot. I don't even hunt, and I can shoot better than you, all right? Oh, I was serious. I got a 410 shotgun when I was six years old, all right? So anyway, that, that like, they, they show me the pictures. They show me the pictures. And I started thinking, you know what? You know what? You can't beat them, join them. I think I'm going to start hunting. But I'm going to do a little different. I'm going to have a deer camera too. But hooked up to my deer camera is going to be a deer rifle. <laughs> 30 alt 6, 30 30, shotgun, doesn't matter. I'm hooking a deer rifle up to my deer camera. And then I'm going to have an app on my iPhone. <laughs> and when a deer comes on my property, it's going to put up a picture of the deer, and I'm going to get a message that says, Do you want to kill this animal? <laughs> yes or no? And if I like it, I'm taking it down. Yes. It's going to drop, and I'll call somebody to go get it. A college student will go in there and drag that thing out for 25 bucks. I can find me a college student that will drag a dead deer out of the woods. That's awesome. See, I can become a hunter. I don't have to put on camouflage. I don't have to pour deer pee, -pee on me. I don't have to climb a tree. I can sit in my bed and take that. Do you want to kill this deer? Yes or no? Yes. I, I'm shooting everything. <laughs> Do you want to kill this squirrel? Yes. <laughs> Do you want to kill this cat? No, okay, no, 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 no. Okay, I'm, okay, I know. That's too far. It's too far. It's too far. So sorry. <laughs> Y'all do this to me. I'm serious. It's this service right here. So... Here's, here's, what, here's what all the hunters are thinking, though. Here's what all the hunters are thinking. You're already mad at me because I made fun of your cameras. <laughs> your ancestors would be so ashamed of you. <laughs> here's what all the hunters are thinking. That ain't real hunting. Like, if I took you into my trophy room and you said, man, how'd you kill all these animals? And I just held up my iPhone, showed you my little app, you'd be like, dude, I cannot respect you because that's the easy way out. Don't miss this, and we're going to see this in this text. The biggest temptation for a follower of Christ is to do what is easy rather than what is right. The biggest temptation for a follower of Christ is to do what is easy rather than what is right. You see what Arnold was telling David? Hey, David, take it all. I mean, I know you came up here to buy it. I know God told you to come up here and purchase it. I know all that happened, but Arna, you, you can just take it. But you know what? David had been a taker all his life. David took Bathsheba. David took Uriah's life. David 
took the census. And David decided at this moment, I'm not going to be a taker, but before we get into that, we've got to talk about where we are because our biggest temptations as followers of Christ is to do what is easy rather than what is right. Let's break that down practically. Single girls, lean in on this one. It's easy to say yes to a guy that asks you out on a date because he's cute and he owns a Bible. It's right to hold out for a man of God that will pursue you in purity rather than persistence to get you in the bedroom. It's easy to walk away from your marriage when you're experiencing frustration. It's right to stay and fight for your marriage. It's easy to stay to keep that habit hidden. You don't talk about it. You don't tell anybody about it. It's right to confess and ask for help. And the biggest temptation that we'll face as followers of Christ in every area of our life, including our finances, is to do what is easy rather than what is right. David refused. David refused. This next verse changes everything. Watch this, verse 24. But the king replied to Arnon, No! I insist on paying you for it. Watch this last phrase. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David said, I'm not taking the easy way out here. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. He said, I'm not giving God my leftovers. I'm giving him my absolute best. Man, the thing I took out of this that resonated with me so much, listen, is the people that God uses the most are the ones who hang on to the least. The people that God uses the most are the ones who hang on to the least. If you want to grab a hold of what God has for you, somebody here tonight needs to let go of something. Maybe it's letting go of bitterness and anger toward another person. Maybe it's letting go of the habit or the addiction. Maybe it's letting, I don't know, but there's some people here tonight, if you want to grab a hold of what God has for you, you got to let go of what you're holding on to right now because God has greater plans for you. David said, I'm going to give God my very best. And as followers of Christ, we're always going to be tempted to give him less than our best. But in this passage right here, David was essentially saying that a 95% commitment to God is 5% too short. Hey, I'm so glad tonight that I serve a God that it, when it came to paying for my sin, he didn't send some under-challenged angel in the back corner of heaven that had nothing to do. When it came to paying for my sin and your sin, he sent his son, the very best he had, as a sacrifice. And if God gave his best for us, then who are we to stand in the shadow of a blood-stained cross and complain about anything that he's asked us to do? Right? God... Gave his absolute best, and David gave his absolute best. And don't miss this. This, for David, changed everything. It changed him personally. It changed David. I don't have time to go into this. I don't have time to go into passages of Scripture. But after this, we see David do a few things before he died that was evidence that God changed him through this decision of, I'm going to purchase this piece of property. Don't miss this. All he did was purchase a piece of property. That's all he did. Which is kind of cool because in Step Up, we're trying to purchase lots of pieces of property. All David did was a pe purchase a piece of property. And don't miss this. It changed him. Second thing is it changed his legacy. It changed his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, his great-great-grandchildren, his great-great... I mean, I could go on, but you get the point. How would you like parents, grandparents, how would you like to be able to do something that literally changed the trajectory of your family history? That'd be kind of cool. And it changed the world. 
This decision to purchase this piece of property changed the world. Now, this is where some of you go, okay, you lost me. You had me on the change in me, and you kind of talk about the thing. You had me on changing the, the legacy, but changing the world. Perry, you talk about changing the world. You said last week the BYSSIW, and that was great, and then changing the world, and I'm called to change the world. I can't, I mean, who am I to change the world? I mean, I'm in the state of South Carolina. I can't change the world. David started out as a shepherd in a sheep pen, hanging out with a few sheep. And here we are talking about him 3,500 years later. Don't tell me you can't change the world. Don't tell me you can't make a difference. This decision for David to purchase this piece of property changed the world. And you know when this hit me? Last Friday morning at my kitchen table when I was doing my quiet time. Last Friday morning at my kitchen table, and you don't have to turn there. We're going to put the scripture for you on the screen. I was reading 2 Chronicles chapter 3. 2 Chronicles chapter 3 verse 1 says, Then Solomon, who was David's son, began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. Now, let me stop real quick. Have you heard of the temple? Have you heard of the temple in Jerusalem? It's a hot political button today. I mean, the temple is a big deal. This is where sacrifices were to be altered. It was foreshadowing of the price that Jesus was going to pay for our sin. It was worth billions of dollars. I mean, the temple is a big deal. And everybody in the world knows about the temple. The temple is still a major political discussion anytime people talk about peace in the Middle East. Jewish men and women, Arabs and Christians all consider the temple to be a holy site, a sacred site, a special site. I've been there. I've been to where the Dome of the Rock is. I've stood in the place. I've seen where they said the original temple was built. I mean, I'm telling you, from being there, it's a pretty special place. And the temple literally changed the world. The temple is all over end times prophecy. It's a major part. The temple, can we agree that the temple changed the world? Can we agree, yes or no? Yes, I'm glad you thought that. Let's keep reading that verse. And then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father, David. Watch this. It was on the threshing floor of Aranah, the Jebusite, the place provided by David. The temple was built on a piece of property that David purchased when God told him to step up. And if God did for David what he did back then, he can do it for us again. God, God, change the world through our decisions to step up. Hey, Here's what I know about this church. It's changed me over the past 13 years. When I first started this church, people asked me all the time, did you ever see this? No, no, I did not. I was as excited about 15 people showing up in the living room as I was about thousands of people showing up today. I don't believe that. Hey, that's on you. you I, I'm telling you, I was pumped up. 15 people came today, I can't sleep. But this church has changed me. It's taught me to dream bigger dreams. It's taught me that Ephesians 3.20 is true, that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. It's taught me that I can trust God. It's taught me that I can be vulnerable that, because when I'm struggling with something, if I, if I talk about it rather than hide it, it doesn't make you hate me. It sets you free because you're like, if that guy can talk about what he's going through, I can talk about what I'm going through. It's taught me. It's taught me to trust people. I mean, this church has changed me. This church has changed some of you. There are hundreds of people here tonight on every campus that you're not the person that you were when you walked into the doors of this church the first time. You might not be where you need to be, but you're not where you used to be. You're closer to Jesus. Your marriage got healed here. You might have gotten healed here. You got set free from an addiction here. You don't sell drugs anymore. You're not, a, you're not 
You don't have that eating disorder anymore. You don't struggle with what you used to struggle with anymore because Jesus has changed you. And as people have given over the past years, people have changed. Do you understand the change that is going to take place in our children on every campus? How many of you right now on every campus have kids back in Kids Spring? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You have kids back in Kids Spring. You have kids back in Kids Spring. All right. Think about this for a second. For us... And for our few students, listen to this. For us, this is a miracle. For our children, this is normal. Is that not insane? Talk about change. We think this is miraculous, and our kids think, that 30, 40, 50, 100, 250 people receiving Jesus is just another Sunday at church. Man, that's changed right there. And if this is our, that, listen, our, our student pastor said this years ago, and I, I latched on to it. Our ceiling is their floor. And it changes everything. And Jesus has called us to change. And listen, you know what? I believe God's yet to change the world. And I believe he's going to do it through the ministry of this church. We're going to see people far from God come to meet Jesus and then follow him step by step. So in just a little while, in just a, just a little while, we have something prepared for you. We're going to take up our step up offering. When you walked in tonight, you had one of these commitment cards. And um, it, it was real cool. Lucretia and I, I'll tell you about that. Lucretia and I filled out ours this morning. And listen, this is all I'm asking you to do tonight. Do what God told you to do and step up. Don't do what's easy, do what's right. And step up. If God's put something on your heart, you step up and you do what God's told you to do. Because here's what I'm going to guarantee you. As you step up, God will change you. God will change your family. And God will change the world. Hey, he did, it in that, he did it in that story. And he's the same God. So I'm going to pray, and then when I say amen, our band's going to play, and we've prepared something for you to watch before we make our financial commitment. So I want you to stay seated and watch this, and then I'll be back out and instruct everybody what to do. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for changing people. God, over 22,000 people have met you, Jesus, as the result of what you're doing in this church. And Jesus, this is my prayer. That tonight, as we reflect on the fact that you change people's lives, Jesus, may we celebrate the change that you have done in our lives, and may we anticipate the change that is yet to come all over this state, all over this nation, all over this world. Thank you, Jesus, for this story that we just read, and it's our prayer, God, that you will move our hearts during this time. We love you, Jesus, and we ask this in your name. Walked away.
that's why we do what we do. Because every number has a name, and every name has a story, and every story matters to God. And I want you to be a part of this. In the year 2001, 52 people gave $26,000 so we could move from the Sullivan Building to the Fine Arts Center. 52 people gave $26,000, most of whom are still here. I could bring those 52 people on this stage tonight and ask them, do you think that was a good investment? And every one of them would say absolutely. When we hit 100,000, we're going to look back on this night. And I'm going to tell you, I told you God could do it. But you're going to know you had a part in it because you stepped up. In just a second, I'm going to ask all of our ushers at every campus to get in place. When I say stand, ushers, you get in place. If you're watching online tonight and you're like, man, I wish I was there to make a step up commitment, we made it available for you online. We don't want you to miss out on this opportunity. So you can go, um, you, you see the button, it's, it's there very clear. I promise you it's very clear on our website, uh, our step up. Um, and you can go there and make, you can fill out your pledge card online. If some of you are here tonight, you're like, I'm just not ready to do this. I need to pray through it. You can go home and fill it out online tonight. But for the rest of us, we're about to step up. We're about to step up and it's gonna be big. We're gonna, just a second, we're gonna stand. We're gonna sing that song that our band wrote, Our Great God. We're gonna tear the roof off of this place. And as the offering baskets go by, we're going to drop this commitment in, signifying that we're doing something tonight that is bigger than us. We're doing something not for us. We're doing something for a God who loved us and saved us and called us out of where we are and to where he wants us to be. And his plans are greater for us and his plans are greater for our church. And we're going to celebrate that as we sing. But for some of us, before we even get to that point, we've got some business to do with God. So would you stand with me and uh, let's pray on all of our campuses. Father, I pray right now. In the name of Jesus, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would speak to every heart, sharing with us, Lord, what we need to do. With heads bowed and eyes closed right now on every campus, tonight's message wasn't a capital campaign step up money message. It was a next step message for you. There are people here tonight that your next step is to stop running from God and give your life to Jesus. 38 people today have prayed to receive Christ as a result of what God, because God spoke to them. In just a second, I'm going to give you a chance to respond because tonight you don't need to make a financial commitment. You need to commit your life. There are people here tonight that you've got the eating disorder. You've got the porn addiction. You've got, you're addicted to prescription drugs. You've got the marriage issue. You've got the issue that you felt like you couldn't talk to anybody about it. And Jesus spoke to you tonight when I was preaching about that and said you need to step out of what you did you need to step out of what you're doing you need to step into who you are and the first way to do that is to actually ask for help to confess and ask for help we've got volunteers at every campus that would love to pray with you and pray for you if that is you so on every campus right now if God spoke to you and you're like I need someone to pray with me or for me about my next step God spoke to me and I want to know what to do next on every campus I want you to step out of your aisle and I just want you to walk out the back door and I want you to go right now I want you to go right now I don't want you to look around and I don't want you to see if anybody else is going because they are because they are moving I want you to move right now dozens of people just started moving in Anderson so if you need to move right now in Florence or in Columbia Spartanburg or Greenville I want you to go right now Greenwood let's go God spoke to you listen if God spoke to you tonight don't give the devil a victory by standing there when God told you to move. If you're scared to death to go, ask the person beside you that brought you. Say, hey, will you walk back there with me? I need to, I need to nail down this salvation thing. I need to stop running from Jesus tonight. I need to confess. I need to ask for help. My marriage is falling apart. I need to quit doing what I'm doing. I don't want to live this way anymore. Listen, tonight is the night that God brought you here to call you to step up. He was specific with David, and tonight he's been very specific with some people in this room. You go ahead and respond. The rest of us, I'm going to pray, I'm going to say amen. And when I say amen, I don't want you to leave. I want you to sing. I want you to sing this song louder than you sang it the first time this evening. The offering buckets are going to pass by, and you stick this commitment in, knowing that tonight you're committing to something greater than any of us in this room. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
Thank you for your greatness. Thank you that you're greater than anything we could pursue. You're greater than any relationship. You're greater than any high. You're greater than any buzz. You're greater than any drug. You're greater than any career. You're greater than any amount of money. You're greater than any prestige. You're greater than any fame. You are greater than any fortune. You are greater than anyone or anything, Jesus. We thank you tonight that you are our great God. You are the only one on this planet worthy of our worship. You are greater than a field goal. You are greater than a touchdown. You are greater than a game-winning shot. You are greater. And tonight, God, I pray that we would, as a church, celebrate your greatness like you've called us to. We love you, Jesus. May we rejoice in this time. And all God's people said, amen.